This is Dr. Jerome Corsi, and today it's uh, Tuesday, it's January 2nd, 2024. It's our first broadcast in the new year. Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, it's an election year. It's going to be a very interesting year to cover the news. Uh, we're going to start doing more interviews on the Truth Central. I've also started up a substack, which you can follow as Jerome Corsi PhD. It's the substack. It's all together. Jerome Corsi, PhD. We'll have it up on the uh, Lake Tour Central website so soon so you can see it. And um, I I'm going to build the substack with a lot of uh, background information and detailed information, excerpts from my books, a lot of archiving of information, plus commenting on and keeping up with current stories. It's going to be an election year. It's going to be a lot happening this year. And I want to uh, be again, I'm not retired any longer. I came out of retirement and I'm going to reestablish my presence on social media and try to, uh, again, make a, an impact as we go through 2024 with the one of the more pivotal elections in American history coming up. Uh, today, I want to cover a variety of stories. Very quickly, there's things going on in Japan. Japan, there was a very bad airplane crash yesterday and uh, the where the commercial airliner uh, collided with a Coast Guard airplane, evidently in Japan, and had a massive fire. There's a lot on the internet on it. I encourage people to look for various of the videos if you want to see it. Everyone remarkably escaped from the airplane uh, uninjured. There was also a story uh, of an earthquake that hit yesterday in Japan, and it killed quite a few people. It was a... Um, and the damage, of course, is still being assessed, but it was a fairly significant earthquake. And Japan does get hit by earthquakes relatively frequently. I mean, Japan, again, people have to remind ourselves, we all have to remind ourselves that the earth is not a stable place. The earth goes through many changes that are, in a sense, catastrophic changes. And earthquakes are sudden and they are catastrophic. So th those are two major stories, powerful earthquake, and there's about 50 people that have been reported dead already, and others, thousands of homes were wiped out. And uh, there's been a lot of Japanese earthquakes over the last 30 years, and there's stories that trace that back historically, if you're interested. Also, a South Korean opposition leader, this Lee J. Myung, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, it's J A E dash. M-Y-U-N-G. He was stabbed in the neck. Uh, he was giving a press conference, and somebody came up to him as, a, as if they were a supporter, wanting an autograph, and they pulled out a large knife and stuck him in the neck. So, again, we're starting out with the usual kinds of catastrophes and natural disasters and political disasters that unfortunately characterize human history. Uh, the major stories I want to cover today, first, Israel. Uh, Israel now is fighting a war on three fronts. Uh, the Israel, of course, has been going through this incursion into the Gaza Strip. And Israel has been now attacking very heavily in the center and south of Gaza. Gaza Strip, as I've mentioned for everybody's reference, I've mentioned this several times, is a narrow strip of land on the Mediterranean in Israel that borders Egypt. And the Egyptians have put up a wall. They do not want the Palestinians. Palestinians have been thrown out of every country they've been in, and so the Palestinians are not particularly welcome because they are radical, and they tend to overthrow governments of their host countries. It happened in Egypt, the, the attempt to overthrow the government it happened in Lebanon, it happened in Jordan, it happened in Egypt, and Egypt does not want the Palestinians back. Now, the amount of damage that has been done by Israel in this war is extensive. I was looking at some of the statistics today, and it appears that uh, Israel has, the, the vast majority, about 75% of the population has already fled Gaza, and the remaining population will probably be increasingly fleeing as Israel intensifies the fighting in the central and south to clean out 
Hamas, which is a terrorist organization that was funded by, has been funded by Iran. So nearly 70% of Gaza's 439,000 homes and about half of its buildings have been damaged or destroyed over the past three months. Most of the Strip's 35 or 36 hospitals are sh shut down and only eight are accepting patients. More than two thirds of its schools are damaged. And uh, again, this is a, a, a major effort by Iran to Right now, they're going to depopulate Gaza. Whether they let the Palestinians back in or not, I think is being debated in currently in Israel. Uh, Israel is now trying to hold some of the council meetings with the security council structure within the Israeli government is now very heavily discussing what are the next steps in this war. It's clearly expanding as we have um, seen in terms of uh, incursions by Israel into Gaza being extensive and and this time determined, despite pressure from the United States and the United Nations to withdraw Israel's pressing forward and in a in a very determined way, destroying the tunnel system underneath Gaza and uh, killing a large number of the militants involved in the October seventh attack. Israel seeking them out with particular vengeance. And um, the ferocity of this Iran the Israeli attack, uh, I think, having watched Israel over decades, this is the most determined incursion into Gaza or Lebanon that I've ever seen Israel do. And Israel is not asking for okay, and they're not uh, being persuaded to quit by international pressure. Now, the next story is again, an expansion of the war, which is from Yemen. Yemen is a country on the Red Sea. Uh, if Chris could probably possibly show us the map in a minute here to get it. Uh, there was a incursion over the weekend, a, a, another set of, of kind of violent acts that uh, the shipping in the Red Sea is very important to international trade. Uh, it, this is the connection into the Mediterranean through uh, the Suez Canal and that leads out into the uh, through the Red Sea and, and through a gulf uh, ultimately into the Mediterranean and it's one of the access points that allows ships to go from the Mediterranean directly to India and China without going around uh, the, the Cape uh, at, the, at the bottom of South Af at South Africa, at the bottom of Africa, that takes a, adds about a third of the trip. It's more expensive, and Yemen, which is a country right there on the Red Sea by Saudi Arabia, you can see you've got these narrow straits here in the Red Sea, coming into the Gulf of Aden, then into the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean, and Yemen and Somalia have been two countries which have fostered these rebels or essentially pirates that attack shipping in this region in the gulf of aden or in the red sea and there was an incident over the weekend of an attack on a maersk uh, container ship maersk is one of the uh, major shippers internationally and this yemen militia group sent out these small boats and was were attacking uh, the uh, one of the ships from the Maersk line. Okay, so I'll read a bit of the article here. Regional instability um, risks are mounting in the Red Sea following the Iranian-backed Houthi, H-O-U-T-H-I. Those the rebels, the radicals uh, in um, in Yemen, backed again by Iran. They struck a Maersk container ship on Sunday, yesterday. On, on New Year's Day, and U.S. forces responded with attack helicopters that eliminated three small boats and ten killed ten rebels. Of course, the Yemen militia group then warned of consequences and repercussions because of the U.S. aggression, not mentioning or affirming that they were the ones who initiated the attack. Now, again, what this means is that the United States has sent 
some major naval forces into the this area of the Mediterranean. The if we go back to the map again, you can basically see how this all kind of ties together. You might get a little bit of a, of a bigger view, Chris, if you can find it, because this is a very sensitive region of the world, and the shipping that comes through this area, a lot of the oil that is worldwide used comes through this these narrow straits and are subject to attack by these rebel forces. So this again is an expansion which can be considered in a sense as an expansion of the Israeli war because it again involves these radical terrorist groups that are supported by Iran. If we get just a little bit bigger view of the whole region, Chris, if you can find a map, I'll point out how this is all connected because you'll see that Israel is really a very small uh, sliver of land, uh, which is north of Saudi Arabia, and it's um, west of Syria, and south of Lebanon. And all these countries, Yemen, uh, Syria, uh, Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, uh, the remnants of ISIS in Syria, and of course Hamas in the Gaza, these are all, in a sense, determined enemies of Israel because they are all sworn to the destruction of Israel. Okay, there we go, a little bit bigger. There, You can see how this whole area comes from the Mediterranean down into the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and then into the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean. So the shipping coming from Europe headed to India and China passes through this region. And a lot of the oil comes through this Red Sea and the Persian Gulf, which is another hotspot for terrorist activity, which the Persian Gulf is south of Iran. And, um, and the Red Sea is to the east of Saudi Arabia. But you can see how this, as it were, peninsula, which is predominantly Saudi Arabia with Yemen and Oman, at the south, and Jordan, Iraq, Syria, and uh, to the north, and Iran is uh, clearly on the on the uh, east here. And Iran is a force which is a much larger country, very rich in resources. But again, Iran will support the terrorist activities throughout this region. And Saudis, who are Sunnis, and the Iranian mullahs, who are Shiite. And Shiites believe that the family of the Prophet Muhammad should be the rulers of Islam, and the Saudis uh, favor secular control. Uh, when Turkey had the Ottoman Empire going back into the 1800s, that was probably the largest caliphate that had existed, certainly in modern times. So this whole region here, from Turkey through Iran, through Yemen, through uh, Saudi Arabia, Oman. This has been a, a, a difficult area of the world for a long time, probably going back biblically 2,000 years ago. And uh, that area of the world is now again inflamed with the war that, that was prompted by the October 7th attack of Hamas onto Israel, which was a vicious attack, raping, killing young children, burning people alive, taking hostages. It was a horrific attack, which is what has in, prompted Israel's very strong response. So that gives you a good idea of how the geography works here. And I'm going to cover one more story that I want Chris to comment. The story, the last story here on geopolitics, then we're going to shift to some domestic issues, is that um, we're, we're, if we're, talking, we're seeing again that Ukraine is really, I think, the, the war in Ukraine is gone, it lost. Uh, the, there's no chance Ukraine is going to take back territory. Uh, over the holiday weekend, New Year's, Russia upped the attacks on Kiev and other northern cities. So Russia's now started moving on Kiev. They've started missile attacks, uh, very heavy missile attacks, very heavy bombardment, destroying a good number of buildings in Kiev, which is the uh, capital of Ukraine, 
And going back historically several hundreds of years, Ukraine also at one time was the was the capital of Russia. This, this is an area of, of the world, again, which is very, very contentious. And Ukraine has been fought over for thousands of years, again, because of its strategic position on the Black Sea. And it has a, a, a lot of oil in the Odessa region. Odessa is a city on the Black Sea. And Ukraine on the east has been largely favoring Russian and Russian-speaking. On the west, it has been aligned with Germany. In World War II, was aligned very strongly with Hitler. Uh, and, of course, Hitler did invade Ukraine and went after the oil, which he desperately needed. Uh, Germany had coal, but it did not have oil. And that was one of the major aspects of World War II was Germany's determination to find a way to get enough oil and Japan's determination to find enough oil in order to continue their expansionist um, objectives in the 1940s. So we have both regions of the world now in war, although I think that the Ukrainian war is at a standstill. There was comments by, uh, by Michael Maloof, whom I know Michael Maloof. I have spent time with him. He was an analyst from the um, State Department, I believe, or it was Pentagon. I think it was Pentagon, actually. And uh, Michael Maloof has commented on this region for years, his assessment in an interview was the United States has our appropriations hung up. There was no agreement at the end of 2023 to get a budget passed of any kind. And the government is facing a shutdown by January 17th. If um, Biden administration and Congress can't renegotiate this funding for Ukraine and Israel, and at the same time enforcing the border. What Malou said is, I think the Republicans to date have held firm, and we'll see if they hold on, but there's no stomach right now any longer to fund the Ukrainians. Frankly, the people that see the war is over, basically the Ukrainian counteroffensive failed, and there's no way that the Ukraine is going to take back the territory that Russia holds. Russia holds uh, the eastern part of Ukraine, and it, Russia holds a lot of the southern part of Ukraine on the Black Sea, including Crimea. So Russia's won this war, uh, how it ends with all the billions we've spent. And I think our government has fought this war in large part to keep the money laundering going in Ukraine. It's one of the money laundering and, and corrupt, most corrupt areas of the world. And of the Biden administration, the Biden family personally have benefited a lot from Ukraine's corruption. And our Department of Justice does nothing. The Department of Justice has gotten to be worthless as it moves increasingly to be involved in counterintelligence, trying to decide if Catholics who like the Latin Mass are white supremacists who, under this woke theory, are the new insurrectionists, which is ridiculous. You know, the Department of Justice was not constituted to do spying on the American people. But now we've got the NSA spying on American people, the CIA, and the Department of Justice. This is an intolerable situation. And finally, the New York Times is covering today, and it surprised me that they're covering it, the fact that the U.S. debt is now unmanageable. And in fact, it's becoming out of control. Uh, it's surprising to see the New York Times getting onto the story because through the Obama administration, they were saying, don't worry about the debt. Interest rates were kept at zero intentionally by the Federal Reserve to boost the economy for Obama, whom they loved. But the point is, the now that interest rates are higher, we are seeing that the federal debt at, at $34 trillion is uh, pretty much out of control. If you look at the curve, we have gone to uh, about 120% of our gross domestic product, when in 1980, we were under 50%, the debt ratio to our GDP. And once you get over 100%, it becomes a real problem. But the steep rise has gone on since about 2004, uh, 2000, certainly by 2008 and 2010, under the Obama years, the debt started escalating. 
Obama with Obamacare, uh, the federal funding of student loans, which was taken over 100% by the federal government under Obama, all these things, and then the pandemic, which again boosted the federal debt as the money was handed out by the federal government to sustain a minimal economy while the lockdown was in a force. Uh, and so you see here now the interest rate of the United States uh, is not near zero. It's now uh, up to over 5%. And so you're seeing that the inflation has, is a real problem, even though it's not always measured in the inflation index. The indexes are often weighted not to include things like energy, et cetera, to keep the index down. And I don't think the Federal Reserve has any ability to control inflation anymore with the federal government printing as much money as it is. So we're going to cover this in relationship to the getting this free book, because I think in 2024, even though it's an election year, part of the problem is going to be trying to avoid massive inflation, which will uh, clearly have an impact on the election. So they're going to have to try very hard to maintain a balance here with the interest rates probably not dropping very much, maybe increasing, uh, and measuring that against the economic pain already inflicted on the middle class by the interest rates rise that occurred through 2023. Chris, would you like to comment? Absolutely. Uh, uh, but I want to go back to what you were saying about the Department of Justice. <laughs> We can't let them go by without the news that Sam Bankman Freed is not going to be tried. That's right. The Justice Department is not going to try Sam Bankman Freed on, uh, I, I know he's going to be in jail for a very, very long time, no matter what, but the idea is there's going to be no, um, no trial, uh, for his bank fraud conspiracy to operate an unlicensed money transmitting business, bribery of foreign officials, those sorts of things. Because once again, the DOJ is protecting very important political contacts. At least that's coming from me right here, but I'm pretty sure that's how it's working because that's their MO. Well, I'm glad you brought it up. I mean, the uh, the point here is that Sam Bankman Fre Friedman, what, what, what is it? Sam, oh, Sam Bankman Freed. Sam Bankman Freed uh, was funding Democratic Party politicians very heavily. He was one of the major contributors. He contributed to Biden and Pelosi. The list goes on. And so, therefore, all his bribery charges are dismissed. And uh, he's not going to, well, of course they're dismissed because we don't want to have Biden further embarrassed by all the money that was being laundered through this FTX scam, which was a cryptocurrency scam. And it, cl it collapsed. I covered very thoroughly, by the way, in the book on the coming global crash, which is a debt crisis, is going to create an historic gold rush. It's a book I've written with Dean Heskin, who's the CEO of Swiss America. You can get a free copy of this book by calling Swiss America and talk to them about your uh, investments in gold. I think it's time for everybody to get a hold of some gold and silver. It's still trading over $2,000 an ounce. The free number, the toll-free number to get a, a free copy of this book is 800-519-6268. 1-800-519-6268. And there it is. Chris, want to comment? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, once again, that number, I'm going to give that again, 800-519-6268. He also mentioned the debt, uh, spending money on Ukraine. I, it's It's funny. I do believe a lot of people are really getting that Ukraine fatigue, and now it's uh, extending into the Pentagon. Uh, the the counteroffensive did not work, but it's still a political tool. Apparently, uh, the Democrats are still pushing this to either, and I'm, I'm going to either try to get the Republican side to avoid or weaken their stance on the border, uh, on, on the border uh, issue, because again, while the left wants funding for Ukraine for some reason, apparently, the right. Wants, uh, wants, wants more border protection. Neither side looks like they're going to budge. But well, it's going to be an interesting. It's going to be an interesting show. I cover all these. I cover how the inflation occurred in, right. under Jimmy Carter when we had an oil crisis. I cover the 2008-2009 collapse of the subprime market, which caused a real estate crisis, a credit yeah, crisis. Yeah, people don't realize. Uh, 
the one of the catalysts of that was a decision made back in the, the mid 1990s or the early 1990s, if you will, early to mid 1990s about uh, easing up loan requirements for buying a home. And we started getting these things called ninja loans, no income, no job, no assets uh, in the name of, well, as you've heard it many times, equity. What happens? Everything gets screwed up. Uh, banks decide to sell the uh, derivatives, blah, blah, blah. This is the Reader's Digest version. We could go into a whole two or three different shows to go in, uh, in depth about this, but that's but that's an issue. A lot of people say, well, George Bush did it because he was in office. Well, let's put it this way. Yes, there could have been better oversight in the 2000s over the derivative trading, but the fact is uh, anybody who warned anybody who warned about this happening 10, 12 years down the road was shouted down as a racist back in the early 90s. Well, those were a whole series of legislations, and Obama was very much a part of this to try to put people who could not afford homes into homes. They wanted to get um, their supporters to be housed. And of course, it's a worthy objective, but the problem right. is economically, it doesn't work. When interest rates went up after 2008, 2009, that period of time, uh, those loans to subprime borrowers went into foreclosure. Uh, the securities that have been wrapped, these mortgages have been wrapped into securities. Those collapsed. The derivatives collapsed. It was a collapsing credit house of cards, and it can happen again. Uh, let's cover a couple more stories here before we wrap up. Uh, I was very interested to see the Epic Times covering the fact that the climate cult, I think, is, dis is rapidly falling apart in terms of credibility. Yes, they're still out there with Al Gore saying we've got to eliminate fossil fuels altogether. But um, in a commentary today, it was pointed out that the this whole idea of the concentration of carbon dioxide uh, because of burning hydrocarbon fuels has caused uh, the Earth to warm up uh, to a, a dangerous degree. It's completely nonsense. And the Al Gore is out there again, pushing that we have to absolutely stop using fossil fuels. Well, first of all, no fossil ever created a, a barrel of oil. Oil is abiotic, made naturally by the earth on an ongoing basis. Uh, I will this year take the various writings I've done over the years on abiotic oil and put them in a book and consolidate them so they're in one place and easy to read the entire work I've done, the entire body of work I've done. And on Substack, I'm going to be having some very deep archives of work I've done on all these issues to give you background, uh, and it'll be available um, for subscribers, but it will also, uh, many of the articles will be, will be published at least initially uh, free uh, and distributed through social media. So, a lot of articles have been published, including recently, showing that you know, fossil fuels are a minor molecule in the atmosphere. 70% of all greenhouse gases uh, are, are water vapor. So if we did 100% switch over from fossil fuels to these renewables, uh, we would not only have much less efficient energy, which would mean higher cost of energy, and, and it would burn out the current grid because if, if all the cars were electric vehicles charging at night, the, trans, the transmitters would burn out much more rapidly than they do today. Today, in non-peak hours at night, the transit transmitters are, and the whole grid has a chance to cool off. At any rate, the uh, there have been a bunch of articles published. Uh, this uh, One article here, which was done by... Um, Two Norwegians uh, doing a statistical analysis showed that the man-made carbon dioxide emissions are not strong enough to cause systematic changes in the temperature over the last 200 years. They looked at a database, and of course, that's clear. Uh, another scientist said in the International Journal of Global Warming said that the rate of change in carbon dioxide concentration is controlled by global temperature. It doesn't cause global temperature to increase. Carbon dioxide increases follow warming. They don't cause it. The fundamental science behind this, this uh, global warming cult is nonsense. 
And if you take a look at my book, the energy, you know, the truth about energy, global warming, and climate change, you'll see that that's the case. I wrote that book to say that the climate global warmest warmers are lying. And then I followed up by volume two of this great awakening series with the truth about neo-Marxism, cultural Maoism, and anarchy to say that the reason they lie, because they are neo-Marxists who have embraced modernism, this modernist trend, which says that there is no subject, there's no objective reality. So everything is just whatever you want it to be. Your values are as good as my values. It's your value judgment, which leads to the woke schizophrenia where you can define your own gender. And we have to celebrate your definition of your gender, even if it appears to be rather schizophrenic. Now, the schizophrenia is an immersion into some kind of private reality that is unconnected to objective reality, but that's your own little private world. So again, I think there's increasing with this COP uh, most recent meeting in du Dubai, COP28, where they really did not get past a, a directive saying we want to end using fossil fuels. It became apparent that the world is not ready to go there. And thank goodness for that. I mean, India and China resoundingly said, no, they're both going to be using more coal this year than ever. And hydrocarbon fuels are what keep modern industrial society going. Without hydrocarbon fuels, we would live in a much more economically constrained world. And billions of people would die, which I think would be just okay with the World Economic Forum. And the last article I want to cover today is on the student debt crisis, because something remarkable is happening. And that, again, uh, Biden failed to get his socialist agenda done of um, forgiving all of the student debt. So that plan got rejected by the Supreme Court. And now they're back into saying, well, something like 40 percent of those in student with student debt who uh, were supposed to have been making payments again just refused to start making payments again. They're not doing it. And that's that's going to be, again, pretty troubling because there, there's literally billions of dollars outstanding in student debts. And if you get a massive student debt strike where something like four out of 10 people who have student debts simply refuse to pay a penny to retire that debt, then you're going to have a massive problem because you're going to have billions of dollars of student of debt defaulting. Now, again, since it's not by private banks, funding is not by, by private banks, but by the federal government, it'll, it'll impact the federal deficit and just throw the, you know, the deficit and the national debt to a higher level. But, you know, paying $500 more for a student loan payment is going to tax a lot of middle-class families when they're already struggling to put food on the table with increased grocery prices. So there's no new watered-down version of the program that the Department of Edu Education has been able to come out with, and the bills are going out again for people to start paying their student debt. But there are, you know, four out of 10, 40% uh, of the holders of student loans, the student loan borrowers, they're just dodging the payments. This will only create another economic crisis. And again, with $34 trillion in our national debt and the modern monetary theory saying, since we're a sovereign nation, we can pay off our debt by issuing new debt or just by creating a token to pay it off. Uh, this has gotten into funny money. And that is building worldwide a credit crisis, which was a bubble that is certain to bust. When it will bust, I don't know, but it will bust. We will have a global debt crisis here in the near future. So uh, I'll encourage everybody to watch that and be very careful about that because it's happening. Um, and so I want to wrap up today. Chris, any last comments? I was watching uh, Joe Biden brag about this a couple of weeks ago with his usual new intonations where he goes, 
Well, you know, I, 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 they said I couldn't give back the student loan and, and forgive student loan debt, but guess what? And he did this uh, leaning the microphone where he goes, I did that. I just re released $147 billion. And, and the man was patting himself on the back over screwing up the economy again. It's first off, it's not a good lesson to teach young people that they can just uh, take this money and, and uh, the government will just bail them out anyway. That was a bad lesson that a lot of these people, these people's parents were uh, learned when the banks were bailed out after the 2007, 2008 credit collapse. Well, we can't just always keep bailing everything out. Uh, let's wrap up today. I don't want to go over time. Uh, this is um, Dr. Drone Corsi with the truthcentral.com. I always conclude by saying, in the end, God always wins. God will win here, too. Uh, it, we're going to go through the judgment of God. We've killed too many babies in the womb under Roe v. Wade. We've taken God out of our schools, out of our marriages, out of our hearts. Uh, we, a country that abandons God is not a good formula for success. Uh, we will, I think. I don't, know, I don't think God created the human race to fail. I think we'll get through this, but in the spirit of Second Chronicles seven fourteen, I urge everyone to take the remedy that the Bible gives us, which is get on our knees and ask God's forgiveness for letting the world get to this place. We do need God to hear our prayer and heal our land. As Dr. Jerome Corsi, the True Central, we do a podcast every weekday, and we're going to begin doing interviewing to add to this podcast and to the Substack, and we'll add on to the. Uh, our website where you can find it on the upper right hand corner you see the many different channels where we are broadcasting they include um, rumble bitchute uh, many different just take a look in the upper right hand corner and chris if you want to end the broadcast by just pointing out where we're broadcasting that would be helpful you can find us all over the place. Yes, we are on YouTube when they allow us. If you can't find us there, find us on Rumble. We're also on BitChute, CloudHub, and all sorts of audio outlets. We're easy to find there. Ample Podcast, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn, uh, more. <laughs> A lot of them. We're even on uh, Amazon. And yes, you can get us via Alexa. Enjoy. And uh, you can also find uh, us, uh, find the True Central on X. Oh, that's a Twitter symbol here. We're going to fix that one. Facebook, we have, uh, um, well, we're all pretty much all over the place. You can also find, again, keep on keep an eye out for the sub stack, and you can find us on, did I say CloudHub? Did I say CloudHub? Yes, uh, find I think us there too. Yes. And take a look at this book, The uh, Live Longer and Better. We're going to be doing telemedicine this year. I'll be launching a getlongevitymeds.com. We're going to be doing oblaconandmd.com, which is Spanish-speaking. Uh, doctors speaking by telephone to Spanish-speaking patients, uh, and uh, getrxmedsnow.com. All of these will be launched in the first quarter, and we'll be putting them on the uh, website and letting you know how to take advantage of these different telemedicine programs. It's Dr. Jerome Corsi today. It's um, Tuesday, January 2nd, 2024. Thank you for uh, joining us. We'll be back tomorrow. God bless. God bless.